Okay, um, number six. So this is going to be kind of our technically second lecture of the night. We're a little bit behind on time, but that's okay. I want to spend a good amount of time on this. And I just sense from the spirit that this is what he wants to emphasize tonight. So I am on number six in your notes. And I've entitled this lecture, A Case Study on Woundedness and Healing, Immaturity and Maturity, Leah and Rachel. We are now going to spend 30 minutes or so looking at a long series of narratives in Genesis. While our focus has been on Jacob, I don't want us to read the following narratives with a focus on Jacob. I want us to read the following narratives with a focus on two sisters. Leah and Rachel. I want us to compare and contrast these sisters in relation to how they mature through life in the wake of woundedness. As we read their story, and we're going to read Genesis 29 through 30, verse 24, and 35, 16 to 20, fill in the chart below. I'll prompt you on when to fill it in, but it'll be pretty self-explanatory. Then we will do an analysis of these chapters on pages 4 to 6. This is going to be the sweet spot of tonight. I just sense that this is what the Spirit wants to have us spend the majority of our time on. Go ahead and meet me in Genesis 29. Genesis 29. Beginning at verse 16. This chapter is right after Jacob had that encounter with God at Bethel. And remember, he was on the run in that chapter. He hadn't gotten to his uncle's house yet, Rebecca's brother. That's where she sent him. In chapter 29, he arrives there. His uncle's name is Laban. Say Laban. Laban. He arrives at Laban's house. Okay. Remember, at this point, he's still on the run from Esau. They haven't reconciled yet in chapter 29. Here we go, verse 16. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, which is a uh, kind Hebrew way of saying that she was not attractive. <laughs> she had weak eyes. She had weak eyes. If anyone ever tells you that you have weak eyes, it ain't no compliment. It ain't no compliment. She had weak eyes. But Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance, which means in body and face. Form is to body, appearance is in the face. So she had a nice figure and a nice face. Leah had weak eyes. Rachel was beautiful in form and face. Mm. Jacob loved Rachel. Mm. And he said to Laban, his uncle, their dad, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. This has all the makings of a Hollywood romantic <laughs> yeah. Seven years I'll work for you if I can have your daughter's hand in marriage. Laban said, well, it's better that I give her to you, I guess, than some other guy. So stay with me. Verse 20, so Jacob served seven years, big time leap in the text, for Rachel. And they seemed to him but a few days because of the love that he had for her. Say aw. aw. So seven years passed, verse 21, Jacob said, all right, Doc, uh, give me my wife, that I may go into her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people, Big Mama, all the aunties, all the uncles, everybody came together and made a feast. It's wedding time. It's wedding time in verse 22. It's finally time. To, uh, verse 23. He's all right. But in the evening, he, Laban, took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Now, there's a few possibilities of why Jacob didn't realize it was Leah. Number one, uh, this is the end of the night. It's the ancient world. There were no such thing as night lights, right? So when it was dark, it was dark. dark. And the fires had been turned out. So one possibility is he literally just could not see her 
Along with that, she could have been wearing a veil, a wedding veil of some kind, and could have kept that on during the act of consummation, so he did not realize. A third possibility is that he was drunk. Uh, this is a wedding. Possibly, I mean, well, I think it really could be all three. It was nighttime, she was wearing a veil, and he was drunk. He didn't realize that it was Leah. Now, look, look with me uh, at verse 25. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, he's enraged. Can't you see him bustling out of the tent in the morning? What is this you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Now this is ironic. Yes, oh, yes. Because who is Jacob? The deceiver. Yes. This is irony in the text. Jacob is a deceiver and he just got deceived. Yes. Verse 26. Laban said, well, it is not done so in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. So complete the week of this one. Real quick, <laughs> off to the side, in your Bible, a week in Scripture equals seven years. Oh, wow. Now, a week also equals seven days, but week in Hebrew is used two ways, W-E-E-K. It is used to refer to seven days. It is also used to refer to seven years. A week in Scripture could either be seven days or seven years. Based on the context, you figure out which is in view. Mm. It's going to be very important when we get to the book of Daniel. Amen. Okay, When we get to the book of Daniel, he's going to have a lot to say about weeks. He's referring to periods of years. Mm. <laughs> the context helps you figure it out. So Laban says to Jacob, well, bro, you're going to have to complete the week of the seven years of Rachel, and we will give you the other also in return for serving, serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week, or her seven years. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Uh, Laban gave his female servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel to be her servant. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah, and served Laban for another seven years. We'll come back to that in a moment. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb. But Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. That's the first name to write down, Reuben. The spelling of it is right there in the text for you, Reuben. I have an extra pen. If anyone needs extra pens, I have some. Reuben. And write this down on the box next to Reuben where it says son's name meaning. Write down misery. Wow. Okay. Misery, and then put a slash mark and write down, look a son. His name has two meanings, misery slash look, comma, a son. That's Reuben's name. Misery slash look a son. We'll talk about that in a moment. That's Reuben. The oldest. The names of these boys are so important. We'll do that. We'll talk about that in the analysis. But oh, the names of these boys are so important. Okay, continuing on. If I'm moving too fast, just holler, slow down. Here's your house, slow down. Um, okay, now we are in verse 33. She, Leah, conceived again and bore a son and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he has given me this son also, and she called his name Simeon. Write down Simeon in the next box. And then in Simeon's name, write down, heard my affliction. That's what Simeon's name means. Heard my affliction. A-F-F-L-I-C-T-I-O-N. Heard my affliction, Simeon. Verse 34, again she conceived and bore a son and said, Now this time my husband will be attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore his name was called Levi. Write down Levi in the next box. Levi's name means attached. Now my husband will be attached to me. Levi, attached. Three sons. 
Greetings. Have we had any mention of Jacob coming to love Leah yet? No. no. Verse 35, and she conceived again and bore a son and said, this time I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah, which means praise. Then she ceased or stopped bearing. So we have Reuben, misery, Simeon, heard my, heard my affliction, Levi, Attach, Judah, praise. Chapter 30, when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. Oh, this is an interesting She said to Jacob, give me children or I shall die. Somewhat dramatic, but it clues us into <laughs> the state of her anguish. Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel, and he said, Am I in the place of God, who has withheld from you fruit from the womb? Then she said, Here's my servant Bilhah. Go into her. Oh, where have we seen this before? Her grandmother-in-law, who she never met. Them. So that she may give birth on my behalf, that even I may have children through her. So she gave him her servant Bilhah as a wife, and Jacob went into her. And Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Then Rachel said, God has judged or vindicated me and has also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore, she called his name, write this down, Dan, which means vindicated. Vindicated. Dan, vindicated. V-I-N, D-I-C-A-T. <laughs> Verse 7 Rachel's servant Bilhah conceived again And bore Jacob a second son Then Rachel said with mighty wrestlings I have wrestled with my sister And have prevailed So she called his name Naphtali Spelling is in the text Naphtali Which means wrestling Or struggle I've competed against my sister. I've wrestled with my sister. Finally, I have prevailed, and so I'm going to name my son Wrestling. <laughs> Verse 9, when Leah saw that she had ceased bearing children, she took her servant Zilpah and gave her to Jacob as a wife. Briefly on that, we don't have time to get into all the details of it, but though it was not God's best, um... What Leah thought she was doing was an act of honor towards Jacob by giving her servant to him as a wife. And it's very different than Rachel's motivations. Rachel gave her servant to Jacob as a wife for her. But there's some subtle language in the text that indicates to us that Leah was giving her servant to Jacob for Jacob's sake and for the family's sake. We'll talk about that a little bit more in the analysis. Verse 10, then Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a son. And Leah said, good fortune has come. So she called his name Gad. Write down Gad. We're on the next page now. Gad. Under Zilpah, Leah. Gad. And Gad means good fortune. Now, if you're observant, you kind of notice something. Gad means good fortune. Verse 12, Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a second son, and Leah said, Happy am I, for women have called me happy. So she called his name Asher, which means happy. Something has just happened. Verse 14, in the days of the wheat harvest, Reuben went and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband? Would you also take away my son's mandrakes? Rachel said, then he may lie with you tonight in exchange for your son's mandrakes. The text never tells us why Rachel wanted these mandrakes so much, but especially apparently they were valuable. Verse 16, when Jacob came from the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, you must come in to me for I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. The only way she can sleep with her husband is if she hired him out with her son's mandrakes. Mm -hmm. So he lay with her that night, and God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Mm -hmm. Leah said, God has given me my wages because I gave my servant to my husband. So she called his name Issachar, which means wages. Mm -hmm. 
I S S A C H A R. Issachar. Wages. Something is happening here. We'll talk about it in the analysis. Something interesting is happening. Verse 19, and Leah conceived again and bore Jacob a sixth son. Then Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will honor me. Different concept than love. Now my husband will honor me because I have borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun. That's your next, next box. Which means honor. Zebulun honor. Afterwards, she bore a daughter and called her name Dinah. Mm. Wow. Well, unfortunately, we're not going to have time to talk about tonight, but you should read... Uh, chapter 30, uh, what is it, 35, 34, on your own. Verse 22, then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb. Up until this point, Rachel's sons have come through her servant, but now God opens up her womb. She conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach, and she called his name Joseph, saying, may the Lord add to me another. That's the next box. Joseph, which means give me another son. Remember, we are comparing and contrasting these sisters. Give me another son. I'll do some review in just a moment. Let's just do it now. So first we have, you didn't have to write Dinah down, by the way. That may have thrown you off. Just the son. Yeah, sorry, I should have made that one. You didn't have to write Dinah now, just the sons. So we have Reuben, which means he was shouted out, right? The next son is which means third son is which means next son, which means next son, yep, next son, uh-huh, right, now we're on the next page, Zophalia. Yeah. Dad, which means uh -huh. Asher, Asher, happy, happy. Israel, wages, Zebulun, honor, Joseph, Joseph give me another son. son. Okay, now we have to turn over to chapter 35, beginning at verse 16 to get the birth of the final son. 35, mm -hmm. verse 16. 35, verse 16. This is several years later. This is after Jacob and Esau have reconciled. The text says, Then they journeyed from Bethel. When they were some distance from Ephrath, Rachel went into labor, and she had hard labor. And when her labor was at its hardest, the midwife said to her, Do not fear, for you have another son. And as her soul was departing, for she was dying, she called his name Ben-Oni. Write down Ben-Oni. Now, the boy's name isn't going to say Ben-Oni because his father's going to jump in. Write down Ben-Oni, and then under son's name meaning, write down sorrow. Ben-Oni, sorrow. Now, the reason why... I'm sorry. Uh-huh. How is B-E-N, right, dash, dash. Oh, so, okay. so that's in the first okay. box. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the first box, yeah. Okay. B E N O and I. B E N O and I. Sorrow is the son's Now, uh, this was considered to be a curse because she's dying. And so the text says, look in uh, the latter half of verse 18, but his father called him Benjamin. So underneath Ben-Oni in that same box, right, Benjamin. And Benjamin means son of the right hand. Everyone, uh, 
few more seconds to get caught up in all the writing. I know that was a lot. Now we're going to do the analysis. All right, here we go, analysis. Leah and Rachel were both wounded by life. For Leah, her woundedness came early in life. It is easy to imagine that for years she was overshadowed by her younger, prettier sister, the beauty queen of the family, Rachel. Can you imagine all the relatives, family, friends, and boys in the neighborhood giving constant attention to Rachel and routinely neglecting Leah? It is without question that Leah's young heart was punctured by a wound of forgottenness and rejection. Mm. Yeah. When Jacob arrived in Haran, he did not in the slightest desire to marry Leah. He asked Laban if he could work to marry Rachel, the younger sister, in a non-customary act. Once again, we see that Leah was overshadowed. The only way she eventually gets to marry Jacob is through her father's trickery and deception. Mm -hmm. Yet, even that was not enough. Literally, the next morning after their marriage was consummated, Jacob immediately rejected her and was enraged with Laban for his actions. Here we see that Leah's childhood lifelong wound only grew deeper. To add insult to injury, she then had to sit by for seven years and watch her husband work tirelessly to do what? Marry another woman. Even further insulting, the other woman was her sister. The same sister she had been comparing herself to and living in the shadow of for nearly all of her life. Leah was literally a debt for Jacob to pay off so that he could have what he really wanted. Through each of those seven years, Leah's wound grew deeper and deeper. Yet further, once Jacob finally married Rachel, he did not divorce Leah. He was still married to her. So imagine this. Leah had to then live as the lesser loved, in fact hated, wife of Jacob. The wound only grew deeper. Turn the page. In light of these wounds, when Leah finally gave birth, she named her first son Misery. Because that's what she thought her life was. Her second son, she named Heard My Affliction. And her third son, she named, now my husband will be attached to me. Do you notice what's happening there? Leah was taking the pain of her life experience, in, her life experience and importing it into the names of her children, which represents their life. More than that, repeatedly the text tells us that her hope was for her husband to love her because of the son she was giving him. In other words, Leah was saying, if I can't find healing of my wounds through my marriage, maybe I can find it through my children. If you know anything about the inner psychology of marriage dynamics and family dynamics, you know this is a common shift that many women and men make in their marriage. They take the dissatisfaction and unfulfillment they have with their spouse and then try to find satisfaction and fulfillment in their children. This is incredibly suffocating and stifling for the child. Expectations are placed on them to heal wounds that preceded their birth. However, God did not design children to heal those wounds. Thus, many parents are routinely disappointed when their children grow up and move on with their own lives because then the parent has to face the reality that their children were not for them. Here we see many parents enter into obsession and heartbreak when they become empty nesters because they then have to return to the spouse or unfulfilled life that they had 18 plus years prior. <laughs> However, when we get to verse 35 of chapter 29, Something remarkable happens in the inner recesses of Leah's heart. She accepts her wound. After this moment in the text, we never see Leah strive to heal her wound on her own by having children. After this moment, Leah is no longer obsessed with her husband loving her. After this moment, Leah no longer feels the need to compete with her sister. The moment is when Leah said, this time. This time which indicates that she hadn't been. But she said, this time, this time. I will what? Praise the Lord. And she names that son Judah, which means praise. It is at this point, underline this, that Leah's healing began. When she resolved to praise the Lord, which includes trusting him and releasing pain to him, she began to heal. Now watch this. Here's how we know that things changed for her. In verses 9 through 13 of chapter 30, 
the two sons born of her through Zilpah are named what? That's mighty different than the names of her first three boys. She went from misery, affliction, now my husband will be attached to me, then praise came in, and now good fortune. Yes. Leah had reached a different place of maturity and contentment in life. She resolved to praise the Lord in spite of her circumstances and disappointment. And that changed her. Yes. Notice, it did not change her circumstances entirely, because Jacob never loved her, but she changed. <laughs> On the other hand, we have Rachel. Remember, we're comparing and contrasting. Rachel never reached this place of contentment, maturity, and peace in her life. Unlike her sister, Rachel's recorded wound came later in life. Though she was the chosen wife of Jacob, she was unable to have children. Infertility was devastating for a woman in the ancient world, and it's still right. devastating for many today. Right. Remember, this was an agrarian society, not a knowledge or industrial economy. A family received wealth and honor through their livestock and land, both of which required sons to work. Mm -hmm. and thus, honor was placed on a woman every time she gave birth, especially to a son, because she was contributing <coughs> to the family's ability to communicate wealth and honor. So without a son, after a while, you weren't receiving any honor. As time went on, Rachel, though she was beautiful, grew bitter and angry with life, as well as envious of her older sister Leah for the first time in her life, because prior to this, she had been the one that was envied, but she, with the text says, envious of her older sister, because she wasn't able to have a son. Flip the page. When the Lord, in an act of compassion, finally visited her womb, she named her first son, God has vindicated me. Hear the aggression. Her second son, she named, I have wrestled with my sister. Her third son, she named, give me another son. And her final son, whom she died in the labor of, she named my sorrow. Do you notice the contrast? The remainder of Rachel's life was full of striving, competition, and bitterness. She never reached the place of good fortune and happy like her sister Leah. She never reached the place of praising the Lord. She fought the reality of her wound, tooth and nail, literally until the very end when she died. Jacob had to step in and rename the final son from Benoni, which means sorrow, to Benjamin, meaning son of the right hand. Rachel never reached a place of contentment and maturity in life. She never had a praise the Lord moment. And she literally died in struggle. She died in competition. She died still trying to fix the wounds of my life by myself because I'm not going to accept this. For your reflection this week, spend some concentrated, sober-minded, vulnerable time asking yourself, what wounds from life do I have? Am I living in a Rachel place of immaturity, bitterness, and refusal to accept life's wounds and disappointments? Or have I crossed over to a Leah place? where I have decided that despite what has happened, and no matter what will or will not happen, I will praise the Lord. A final note, and this is my favorite. It is Leah's fourth son, Judah, who marked the major shift in her life. Everything Leah received after Judah was a gift. When Judah was born, Leah was changed. If you know anything about the Bible, you know who came through the line of the tribe of Judah. Isn't it fascinating that Judah, the child of Leah's shift and healing, is the one through whom would come the child of the world? Shift and healing. His name Yes. Is Jesus, yes. and we know him as yes. the lion yes. of the yes. tribe yes. of Judah. Yes. Let's take a five minute learning break. We'll come back. <laughs>